So this is the lecture for module two, which I've titled Cosmopolitical Speculations. We're reading the first half of Catherine Keller's book, Cloud of the Impossible, Negative Theology and Planetary Entanglement. And we also read a chapter from a book by Martin Zofransky, uh, where he unpacks this phrase, speculative pragmatism. And so he's inheriting William James, James's psychology, but also uh, John Dewey, Dewey's sociology, and uh, Charles Saunders Peirce and uh, Alfred North Whitehead, their cosmologies, and um, putting them all to service in the articulation of this method. Uh, Zafransky is a sociologist, so it's a sociological method, and um, it's an attempt to think about the future in a consequentialist way rather than a foundationalist way. Um, so in the first module, we read a lot about James's critiques of a sort of idealistic or rationalistic foundationalism. And um, I, should, I should say that this uh, treatment, the treatment that James, William James gives to uh, German ide idealism, Kant, but especially the post-Kantians, Fichte and Hegel. Um, he doesn't mention Schelling, which is interesting, but he's very critical of these idealist thinkers, and I, I don't think he's always fair to them. I teach another course on German idealism, and when you get into these thinkers, and in his better moments, James admits this as well, you know, his he admits his appreciation for their insights, um, but there's some ways in which, for example, James's caricatures of Fichte are unfair, and that you know Fichte was much more relational than the Jamesian caricature would would make it seem. You know, Fichte is often um, painted as a solipsist by William James, and I think uh, when you actually look at Fichte's um, science of knowledge, yeah, it's certainly championing the creative power of the ego, but the ego is always checked by the non-ego, and there's a need for a uh, dialectic of recognition, mutual recognition between free egos. And so, you know, somehow... I think the deeper reading of Fichte is that the absolute ego is the social ego and that our particular empirical egos must be, um, you know, checked by the summons of other empirical egos and only together checking one another can we sort of dialectically slingshot the species into, into higher knowledge and more virtuous practice. So there's a deeper reading of, of Fichte. I just wanted to insert that um, after recording the lecture for Module 1, I, I realized uh, James's treatment of Fichte and, and Hegel also is not totally fair, so I wanted to speak up for them. But I'm, I'm you know, offering this course on pragmatism as a sort of contrast to my course on German idealism. Um, and, and as Whitehead, you know, tries to uh, turn conflicts into contrasts in order to intensify um, the complexity and the beauty of, of our thinking, you know, by putting pragmatism into uh, tension with idealism, I'm trying to uh, not refute idealism, but rather, um, you know, heighten this contrast so that we, we, we grok the importance of, of this conversation, really, um, which is, you know, it's the same tension going all the way back to Plato and Aristotle, with, you know, Plato's more idealistic and uh, Aristotle's more empiricist or empirical um, leaning. So rather than... Um, avoid or pretend like there isn't a at least a polarity here. Um, I'm trying to highlight the contrast for you. So do check out the Zafransky chapter if you have time, but in this lecture 
I'll be focused on the first part, uh, Complications, of Catherine Keller's book, Cloud of the Impossible. Keller is a professor of constructive theology at Drew University in Madison, New Jersey, and she's the author of so many wonderful books. I wanted to mention two very quickly, uh, From a Broken Web, Separation, Sexism, and Self, which she published, I believe, in 1986, is a, uh, it's a feminist critique of patriarchy uh, that integrates Whitehead's cosmology with Jungian psychology and um, does a sort of depth reading of the mythic history of uh, the masculine-feminine dynamic under uh, patriarchal civilization, and it's um, it's really quite quite moving, um, and I highly recommend it for those of you interested in that intersection of um, that tangle of issues. She's also the author of one of my favorite books, um, I think in 2008 or thereabouts, called Face of the Deep, A Theology of Becoming. And in this book, she's, uh, it's a profound meditation on the first few words of the book of Genesis. And um, again, a kind of uh, feminist critique of the patriarchal uh, interpretation of this creation narrative. She's a, you know, as a process theologian, she's, she's rereading the Bible inheriting the Bible uh, as a Christian, but rereading it from a more um, Gaian or Earth-centric and uh, feminist perspective. And read from, from, from this angle, um, she finds uh, actually that this, this tradition, flawed and, and, and scarred and scarring as it has been, um, that there's also there are also profound resources that can be rejuvenated and rejuvenating uh, for us in um, an increasingly post-secular age, right? So there used to be this thesis in sociology that as um, societies became more technologically advanced, as they adopted democratic and uh, capitalist modes of um, social organization that uh, religion would 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 slowly fade away um, to be replaced by some sort of you know secular outlook and um, it has turned out that uh, this so-called secularization thesis uh, has turned out not not to be true religion is is alive and well and taking on ever new forms and and so we live in a post-secular time, and, and Keller, as a theologian, has to you know, start this book by arguing for the relevance of theology. And she ends up saying that you know, theology, and she's engaging with negative, the tradition of negative theology here, that theology should ultimately be a poetics of, um, of silence and of um, unknowing, a practice in what Nicholas of Cuso would, would call learned ignorance, because we have all these special sciences now that give us so much knowledge and information and means of manipulating the world. In this context, theology can't provide us with knowledge, better knowledge than, uh, or better technique than what all these special sciences have provided. So what is the role of theology then? Well, it's to it's to hover at the edges of the disciplines and to play a transdisciplinary role in helping us remember the whole. And traditionally, the word God has been used and abused um, in an attempt to refer to this this whole. And you know, Keller, I think, reflects helpfully on the perils, but also the promise of this word God. But certainly God talk is problematic today. Um, you might question whether it's still relevant. And after reading 
uh, Keller's first few chapters here, I, I, I wonder how you feel about theology if you had been skeptical of it, or even, you know, Christian theology in particular, albeit, you know, her feminist Gaian reading of, of, of Christianity. Um, you know, I wonder how you, whether you are convinced that this tradition uh, in particular, or theology in general, could still be relevant. So, you know, she's, Keller's experimenting with a kind of alter knowledge, as she calls it, and she's searching for an alternative modernity that would be rooted in this negative theological tradition of mystical, you know, theology going back um, to, well, I mean, we could begin with Philo, we could begin with uh, Gregory, Gregory of Nyssa, we could uh, talk about Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite, um, or we could talk about Nicholas of Cusa. And uh, Keller, I think, um, you know, really evocatively uh, rehearses this, this history for us of a, this mystical strain within Christianity that in so many ways is um, uh, discovering insights that we would normally associate with Eastern traditions, uh, a Buddhist or a, a Zen conception of emptiness uh, or a Taoist sense of that which cannot be named. Um, and, you know, Keller shows how politically and ethically charged these mystical insights were so that th this form of contemplative mystical practice was not um, a means of escape from the world, but um, a means of recharging our uh, political aspirations and our um, our social relations, because the logic that Nicholas of Cusa, the theologic that Cusa ends up unfolding, has cosmological implications, right? And so, in other words, Cusa's meditation on the idea of the infinite the idea of God, uh, ended up leading him through, you know, his, uh, logical reflections to a view of the universe as itself also infinite, right? If there's an infinite God and God created the universe, then that universe must itself be infinite because God as infinite is unbounded and can't be separate from that world that universe. And so I think Keller, um, you know, shows how Kusa's alter knowledge, his alternative idea of God as um, infinitely involved in the world and this coincidence of the infinite and the intimate is an alternative way of understanding the nature of the universe to the sort of deist approach that emphasized the transcendence of God that ended up um, motivating Newton uh, to articulate his clockwork uh, universe uh, or his mechanistic understanding of, of and Descartes' mechanistic understanding of, um, of the universe. Turns out Newton's a little less mechanistic than Descartes, actually. <clears throat> but um, the mathematically precise, uh, hypothetical deductive approach to, to science that Newton was articulating does, um, force us to conceive of the universe as a, as a bounded machine, as a sort of, um, yeah, maybe created by God, um, designed the laws designed by God and its motion initiated by God. Uh, but as material stuff, entirely separate from, um, and certainly beneath God. Um, Kusa, you know, in, in contrast, uh, is, he's really flirting with the heresy of pantheism, right? As, uh, Keller suggests, but, but also, um, uh, articulating a panentheism, which respects the mutual, 
transcendence of God in the world, right? The world transcends God just as much as God transcends the world, and yet the transcendence between them is a form of relationship itself, right? Rather than um, being uh, a form of alienation. To transcend is not to stand apart from, but to pass into and through and beyond, but always uh, into and through again. <laughs> and so, you know, transcendence in the context of a process uh, ontology, such as the one Keller is inheriting from Whitehead, uh, you know, shows how this, it, it puts the Kusin, uh, Nicholas of Kusa's um, cosmology of enfolding and unfolding into creative process, right? So that you can see how um, not only is the one equally distributed among and as each of the many, uh, but as Whitehead says when he defines concrescence, the many become one and are increased by one. And so uh, there's a way in which plurality and unity coincide. In 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verses 11 through 13, Paul writes the following. When I was a child, I spake as a child. I felt as a child. I thought as a child. Now that I am become a man, I have put away childish things. For now we see in a mirror darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then shall I know fully even as also I was fully known. But now abideth faith, hope, love, these three, and the greatest of these is love. Keller cites these lines on page 20 of uh, in chapter one, in a mirror darkly, literally translated in a mirror or an enigma. And from, from there uh, spills out uh, some beautiful reflections on the nature of a reflection. She writes, um, there is someone, some other before me, but I and the other alter each other. My perspective constructs what I see before me before I see it. As William James put it, you cannot turn up the gas quickly enough to see how the darkness looks. Yet more darkly, does what I observe observe me observing it? And here I can't help but think of uh, Whitehead's pan-experientialist ontology. I mentioned this in my lecture for Module 1. This question, does what I observe, observe me observing it, is the pan-experiential uh, hypothesis that indeed um, to look is always also, always already also to be looked at. It's an entanglement of the knower in the known, as Keller puts it. So uh, Keller continues about 1 Corinthians, the immediate context of the text is that of the seductive Corinthian entanglement, greater than faith or hope. She quotes Paul, Though I speak with the tongues of men or of angels, if I have not love, dot, dot, dot. And the image of the speculum, the mirror, follows directly upon putting aside childish things, as in presumably the literalism that mistakes its God word for a God entity. My own perspective, Keller continues, implicates itself, mirrors itself back to me differently, enigmatically. What happens is not solipsistic self-reference, but self-implication, a relation to relation itself. Faith can never mean certainty, but only confides faith with the socially explicated trust that love demands. <laughs> 
trust, or troth. Nothing, in other words, is known outside of relation, whether of terror, tedium, or love. Nothing knowable comes constructed ex nihilo, void of context. If something is known at all, it cannot be absolved of relation. Therefore, nothing is known absolutely. Not God, not me, not you, not truth, not justice, not earth, not flesh, not photon. Each is what it is only in relation to its others. To know another is to participate in the construction of that other within the mirror play of a shared context. Both, but both, are still happening in and through each other. Nor does context lend closure. The boundaries of a context of a context are constructs. One context shades into the next, and the next. In truth and in uncertainty, the whole earth might come tangled in every local relation. So then she goes on to talk about uh, Whitehead's ontology and the mutual imminence of all things. And <clears throat> she's connecting this process relational ontology to the ethics of the face and being face to face with God or with each other and coming to recognize the um, ultimacy of relation itself, of being in between, right? In the way that while each of us is individuals, we've become so only, well, only because we've been loved by others and because we love others, right? And so the love that binds us also grants us this capacity to be free individuals. And, you know, think about this developmentally as a child is welcomed into the world by, uh, by loving parents, hopefully, that child learns to be a self only as a result of the self-esteem granted them through this love. Initially by parents, later by, you know, other friends and, and types of relationships. But we become a self only in community, right, would be the idea here. And so this, this is the ethical implication of a process relational ontology. So just to mention a few more highlights from these first couple of chapters... Keller mentions the influence of Whitehead on Martin Luther King Jr. And uh, in our um, a page I've added to Canvas of uh, extra resources, if you want to go deeper for each module. In module two, I've linked to a, um, a short post at the Whitehead Research Project website by Brian Henning that goes into King uh, and his study of his doctoral study of Whitehead's work and some other process theologians as well. Um, and then just to say a bit about Gregory of Nyssa and Pseudo-Dionysius the Areopagite. Um, this is the Neoplatonic strain in Christian theology uh, coming through where um, Plato, famously in his dialogue, um, the Parmenides, he's discussing the one beyond being and making some rather paradoxical statements about it, such as, as Keller uh, shares on page 55, the one in no sense is. And Plotinus would, would later understand the one as beyond our capacity for rational or intellectual reflection because the one is not two it cannot be reflected and so you know for plotinus this is where philosophy fades off into mysticism and for you know plato originally in his scale of knowledge as he articulates it in uh in the republic there is a point beyond dialectic where we become participatory with, we participate in uh, the one. And so in that sense, become intuitively identified with it rather than, and so 
you know, being unable to reflect upon it as though from outside of it. And I think what, what Keller is trying to do with this tradition, inheriting this um, Neoplatonic mystical paradox, is to make the, the one, uh, is, is to render it in terms of relation, right? And it, it doesn't take too much um, metaphysical massaging to, to do this because these two traditions, negative theology and process theology, process relational theology, are so close on so many, so many issues, though. You know, Keller does a great job not collapsing the two and, you know, making sure to note their differences of emphasis. But nonetheless, I think they make a good team here. So uh, Gregory of Nyssa is the one who coins this, this phrase, luminous darkness, great example of the coincidence of opposites. Um, he compares, uh, Gregory of Nyssa compares the Exodus ascent of Moses up Mount Sinai uh, to enter the cloud and speak with God face to face. He compares this Exodus ascent of Moses to Plato's allegory of the cave um, where, you know, the philosopher breaks free of the chains and uh, climbs up towards the light. Keller wants to contrast her meditation on divine darkness and the negative theologian, uh, the tradition of negative theologians in their meditations on darkness. She wants to contrast this with the light supremacism uh, that she thinks has dominated uh, Christian theology. Nyssa then writes these wonderful lines about um, how we must be humble in our knowledge. He says, we lack essential knowledge, not only of God, but of soul, our own soul, body, and universe. We lack essential knowledge of these. He says, who is in a position to know his own soul? And he suggests that you know, indeed, we often seem to ourselves as a crowd of souls gathered. Um, Keller describes this as Gregory of Nyssa's apophatic anthropology, that, you know, if, if God is in some sense infinitely unknowable, then we human beings, as the imago Dei, created in the image and likeness of God, uh, must also be in some sense unknowable, right? And so a profound humility spills out from this negative theology, this admission that uh, God is beyond intellect. Though Keller's careful, you know, to, to acknowledge here that mysticism can become mystification and serve uh, a kind of authoritarian um, dismissal of one's questioning. She wants to avoid that by emphasizing the you know relational ethos, which spills out from an authentic, uh, authentically humble negative theology. Then, uh, with the pseudo Dionysius, you know, who's a fifth or sixth century author, pretending to be not dishonestly, but it's just a sort of rhetor rhetorical. Um, approach that uh, ancient authors and medieval authors took by, you know, writing as if they were um, uh, even even older uh, and always in the form of letters, right? There's a very personal dimension to, to these books that Pseudo Dionysius wrote, but he's pretending to be um, an Athenian uh, lawyer who was converted by by Paul uh, in the first century. And he writes these four books, and there's a series of letters also that are um, about, well, the names of God, a more positive or cataphatic approach to theology, but also a book called Mystical Theology, which is the um, negative ascent to this intuition of, um, well, divine unknowing and uh, infinite, infinite silence, and a contemplative, a contemplative practice, really, really, where one comes to see that 
as Dionysius puts it, God falls neither within the predicate of non-being nor of being. So God is beyond any conceptual difference we might want to mark. Dionysius also, though, refers to a kind of divine yearning, right? And that indeed this, this yearning of God gave rise to creation, right? Craving for ecstatic relation produces the world, as Keller puts it. And so Eros becomes the engine of unknowing in Dionysius' work. Uh, Keller also talks about this anonymous uh, 14th century English author of a book called Cloud of Unknowing, um, where this tradition is carried forward in a, in a much more practical, um, spiritual exercise-based way, where this anonymous author says that, uh, that this nothing, this divine nothing, can be better felt than seen, right? And then when Keller gets into Nicholas of Cusa in chapter 3, she discusses the way that he anticipates Einstein's theory of relativity, where, you know, Cusa recognizes probably while he was on a boat uh, at sea, he traveled throughout Europe uh, as a cardinal um, on many a diplomatic mission. But Cusa says, it always appears to every observer that one is as if at an immovable center of things, right? Um, he even suggests that the earth must be moving in uh, his, his book on learned ignorance a hundred years um, before Copernicus. Uh, Cusa then critiques the Aristotelian and uh, Thomist identification of of God with this masculine, pure act. Cusa, in contrast, uh, says absolute possibility is God and puts a kind of passivity into God. Um, Cusa writes, For I am confronted by the wall of absurdity, which is the wall of the coincidence of creating with being created as if it were impossible for creating to coincide with being created. But, you know, Kusa realizes that God is both creating and uh, creatable, right? Because God participates in the creation. The creation is not separate from God. God is non-aliud. God, God is um, not other than the universe. So you could say God is beyond the creature-creator binary altogether, but, you know, Kusa is willing to say that, you know, for God to create the world, God must be communicating God's self to the world. And, you know, as Kusa says, to communicate is to be created. There's a, there's so much um, that Kusa says that warrants prolonged um, meditation, and so I hope you will sit with it. It can at first sound, well, it is paradoxical, uh, but I think it, like a Zen koan, uh, can crack open uh, the mind um, in ways that uh, you might find transformative. In each creature, the universe is the creature, Kusa says. Every creature is a finite infinity or created God, as much like God as possible, as it is possible to be. Keller describes this as a pancarnation of God. So let me also say a bit about chapter four, the physics of non-separability. In module one, I explored Plato's ploy in the Republic to examine the soul by expanding it to the size of a city. And in this chapter, uh, chapter four, Keller invites us to examine the ethical entanglements of psyche and polis by way of uh, what she refers to as a 
as a contraction to the quantum point of view. Uh, but why does she want to examine ethics by way of physics? It seems like nothing could be more irrelevant to untangling the ethical significance of human action than the strangely knotted world of quantum entanglement. But Keller turns to the surprising and, and refreshing work of a, another feminist uh, philosopher, Karen Barad, uh, in order to lure standard interpretations of quantum theory beyond their normally anthropocentric conceits. So Barad reinterprets Niels Bohr, uh, the quantum physicist. Uh, his, she reinterprets his more Kantian quantum transcendentalism, where, uh, for example, physics wouldn't tell us what nature is, it would only tell us what we can say about nature. Uh, but uh, Barad reinterprets Bohr such that his quantum philosophy becomes um, a more relational ontology. She uh, doesn't mention Whitehead uh, in, in her book, Meeting the Universe Halfway, which was published in 2007, but their projects are clearly convergent. So rather than understanding Bohr's principle of complementarity as a reflection of the limitations of our knowledge of quantum phenomena, Barad asserts that the undecidability of the pre-observed nature of quantum events, right, whether the cat, Schrodinger's cat, is dead or alive before we observe it, right, that this is in fact a constitutive feature of quantum reality, right? It's not just a epistemological, um, a function of our epistemology. It's a feature of reality. So while Einstein was unhappy with, with Bohr's quantum universe, because its apparent indeterminacy just, you know, stood in such stark contrast to the strict determinism of his uh, relativistic universe. Um, he, you know, Einstein went so far as to, to joke that he'd rather give up uh, physics to become a shoemaker or a poker dealer than accept that electrons had free will. Uh, and during an evening walk with a close colleague of Boris Einstein once asked, uh, do you really believe that the moon is not there if nobody looks? But from uh, Barad's perspective, it isn't that the moon isn't there when we aren't looking, it's that when we do look, a new moon and a new me emerge in the encounter. Because it turns out, in light of quantum physics, that the idea of separability itself was was only ever a convenient fiction. Whether we're talking about uh, separability at the level of protons and photons or uh, at the level of human persons. The very notion of an isolated thing, right, a classical particle or a body-bound observer, is undone by uh, Barad's agential realism, as she calls it, wherein the final realities are not isolable entities, but intraactive agencies. And these agencies, these creatures, to use Whitehead's favored term, are not dissolved into their relational interactions. Uh, rather, as Keller writes, the creature emerges within the creative field that it differentiates, such that the attributes that make one creature different from another are acts of differentiation and not inherent properties of a discrete substance. All right, so acts or performances of differentiation are what individuate us moment by moment. Our identities are in this way always established through relationships, through intraactive relationships. Uh, Keller blames the instrumentalist zeitgeist of the post-war United States for keeping physicists from and philosophers from pursuing the full import of the quantum enigmas that were unveiled 
uh, in the earlier part of the 20th century by Einstein, Bohr, and others. Shut up and calculate was the mantra that ended up uh, dominating. But more recently, thanks to physicist philosophers like John Bell and David Bohm and indeed Whitehead, um, the paradigm-shattering implications of quantum entanglement are increasingly and more widely acknowledged. In Keller's words, quote, science inherited from theology, the metaphysics of separate substance, supernatural and natural. Uh, but quantum physics has exposed in broad scientific daylight that the minimum unit, the minimum unit of the universe is a place of active relationship and that each particularity is a distinct recomposition of its world. So that's chapter four. We'll start uh, the next module with chapter five and uh, finish out the book.